Dynamic programming, one of the most popular topics in competitive programming. You can see it everywhere, from interview questions to top-level competitions. One issue with it, it's hard and confusing. Even its name is a scam. There's a story that was chosen to hide the fact that it was a math research. By the way, we have some news about programming lessons, more at the end of the video. Let's break it down. Where does dynamic programming from now on DP come from? And what problem does it solve? And the best way to explain it is with recursion. Recursive functions are overpowered. They can calculate pretty much everything. The way they work is by dividing a big problem into smaller subproblems. This process continues until we get a so-called trivial state. That's where a problem becomes so simple we can calculate the solution directly. A good example is calculating a factorial. Factorial of n is product of all numbers from 1 to n. That's a recursive formula. n factorial equals n minus 1 factorial times n. So, we can say that n equals 1 is a trivial state, since the answer is just 1. In another case, we call factorial of n minus 1 and multiply it by n. This approach works fine for easy problems like this, but on larger, more complex problems, we run into issues. Not only does the number of subproblems grow, we also end up solving the same problems multiple times. That's where our first optimization comes in handy. Memorization Yes, it's pronounced correctly. The idea is as follows. When solving a problem, we save the result. So the next time we get this problem, we already know the result, without any need for computation. Let's look at an example, Fibonacci numbers. The way Fibonacci sequence is defined is that we start with 0 and E1. Then the next sum in the sequence is always the sum of the previous two. To compute them, we can use the recursive formula f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. This will give us the correct answer, but unfortunately it is slow. Each subproblem needs to solve two subproblems to know the result. This leads to subproblem count growing exponentially. But we can implement memoization. Here, we store the result into an array. Now we calculate each f of n only once, and then reuse the results. This greatly reduces time complexity to O of n. This is the essence of dynamic programming. We come up with a recursive solution and optimize it by making sure we don't calculate things twice. But memoization is not the sharpest tool that DP offers. There's a reason why it's also called lazy DP. So let's not waste our time and get to the real stuff. The way DP is usually represented is with an array, similar to how we stored Fibonacci numbers. But we can notice something very important. We can keep the array, but we don't need the recursion at all. We can start by setting f of 0 equals 0 and f of 1 equals 1. Then let's calculate other numbers. We can loop through all i from 2 to n and set f of i equals f of i minus 1 plus f of i minus 2. By the time we calculate f of n, we already know all the previous values, so we can calculate it too. This will give the exact same result, but without recursion. Time complexity stays the same, so we essentially do the same number of calculations. But we avoid doing expensive recursive calls and replace them with a simple for loop. This reduces not only execution time, but also code complexity. The only new challenge that comes with this approach is figuring out the order in which we need to calculate values. We need to make sure that when we calculate some value in a DP, we have already computed all the previous values. But usually it's not the difficult part. Every DP works by starting out with trivial values and calculating more complex values using the previous results. But besides memoization, there are two popular ways to do it. One is what we use in the previous section, sometimes referred to as backwards DP. 
That's because when we calculate the ADP value, we directly look at the previous values to know the result. And with Fibonacci, it works great, no reason to change it. But there's another approach, which can be easier depending on context. Let's solve this problem. There are n steps on a staircase. We start at step number 1, and we want to reach step number n. To do it, we can either move one step forward or skip a step, moving two steps at a time. The question is, how many different ways are there to reach step number n? For example, for n equals 4, there are three ways. Move one step at a time, move one step, then skip one step, and skip a step and then move a step. Let's first solve it with a familiar backwards dp. We say the dp of n, number of ways to reach step number n. dp of 1 equals 1, because we already start there. Now, there are two possibilities of how we can reach step n. We either move there from step n-1, or we skip there from step n-2. So, dp of n equals dp of n-1 plus dp of n-2. Note that when n equals 2, we cannot reach it with a skip, since there's no step number 0. So let's put this if here. Now let's solve it with a reverse dp, also called forward dp. Instead of looking at a state and thinking, how can we reach it? Let's think, where can we go from there? In this case, we can go one step forward or skip two steps forward. We will still begin with dp of 1 equals 1. Now we iterate over all i, including 1. When we visit a state where we reach step number i, we propagate the result. How? We do dp of i plus 1 plus equals dp of i, this is moving one step forward. And we do dp of i plus 2 plus equals dp of i, this is skipping a step. Note that for that to work, we have to fill the array with zeros first. Also, make sure you don't try to jump past step number n, so put this if here. With that, our first forward dp is ready. We get the same result, but in a different way. So what's the difference? On easier problems, preference. On harder problems, only one of these might work, for various reasons. What's important is the intuition behind it. We are effectively still writing the same recursive solution. But now, instead of looking at it as a magical function that calculates stuff, we think of all subproblems as states. States from which you can go to other states. This intuition will prove to be fundamental for future problems. All previous examples we've shown had only one parameter. We worked with a one-dimensional dp. But what's stopping us from adding second dimension, another parameter? And the following problem is often referred to as turtle dp. You have a grid of n by m cells. There's a turtle in the top left corner. It wants to reach the bottom right corner. Now to reach its goal, turtle has two moves. Move one cell to the right or one cell down. Also, in some cells there's cabbage. When turtle reaches a cell with a cabbage, it consumes it. Turtle's goal is to not only reach the bottom right corner, it is to eat the most cabbage possible. Note that it can never go back, so it can't always eat everything. Your goal is to find the number of cabbage the turtle can eat. I'll give you time to pause if you want to solve this problem for yourself. Ready? Let's define dp x y. dp x y, maximum number of cabbage we can eat when we reach cell x y. Note that we don't care about the path itself, we just need to know the maximum number. Where can we move next? If we are not at the bottom boundary, we can go down. Same goes when we want to go to the right. So, how do we make these transitions? Here's code. Let's break it down. dp of x, y plus c of x plus 1, y is how much cabbage we'll eat if we go from the current cell down. Note the strange coordinates, x is down and y is right. I know it's strange, but that's how tables are usually indexed. We assign this number to dp of x plus 1, y, since that's the cell that we move to. 
However, we might have already found a better way to reach it. So, we take the maximum of the two. If our path is better, we'll take it. Otherwise, we'll keep the old result. Feel free to pause to really understand what's going on there. Now, we can do the same transition going to the right. What would be the starting state? The turtle always starts in 0, 0, so let's use that. The P of 0, 0 equals C of 0, 0, since there might be a cabbage at the starting cell. The last part is to figure out the order in which we calculate the P. There are a few possible ways to do that, but the simplest is this nested loop. Why does it work? When we process state x, y, we want to be sure that all of its previous states have been processed already. In this case, it's the cell above it and the cell to the left of it. As you can see, we've already visited all the cells in the row above it, if it exists, and the cell to the left of it, if it exists. That's all we have to show to prove that our dp will work. After all that computation, the answer lies in dp of n-1, m-1, the maximum number of cabbage that can be eaten when reaching our target cell. Knapsack is another classic. It solves the following problem. You have a bag with a capacity of W units. There are N items. Each item has some volume or weight W of I and some cost C of I. You can put as many of these items as you wish, as long as the total weight doesn't exceed your bag capacity. You want to find the maximum total cost of items that you can put inside of your bag. Here what's important are the constraints on W. Cost can get quite large, but total weight is only 2000. Pause to think what DP can solve this problem. Ready? We'll define a DP as follows. DP of IJ is, after considering first I items, we've picked some of them, such that the total weight is J. The value dp of ij is the maximum total cost of those items. Look at this example. What's the value of dp33? We have looked at first three items. We took some of them with a total weight of 3. In this case, there's only one way to do that, by taking items 0 and 2. The cost that we get is 2. So, dp of 3, 3 is 2. How do we make transitions from dp ij? Let's consider item number i. Note that items are numbered from 0, so we haven't looked at item number i yet. There are only two actions that we can do with it. Either we put it in the bag, or we leave it out. Second option is easy. We simply go to dp of i plus 1, j, without changing capacity nor cost. So, dp of i plus 1, j equals maximum of dp of i plus 1, j and dp of i, j. The first action is a bit more interesting. We know we can exceed back capacity w. So, this transition is only possible if current total weight, j, plus this item's weight, w of i, is less or equal than back capacity W. When we take this item, total cost increases by C of I, so the transition looks as follows. Make sure you understand these transitions before we continue. Now let's think of the order. Every time we make a transition, we increase I by 1. So the only rule we have to follow is that we iterate through all i's in an increasing order. Total weight j can be iterated through in any order, so let's just go from 0 to w. What is the starting state? Obviously, dp of 0, 0 equals 0. That is, we haven't considered any items yet, total weight is 0, and total cost is also 0. So, after calculating this dp, where can we find our answer? We know we should consider all given items, so i must be n. But what about total weight? 
it doesn't necessarily have to be equal to W, it can be anything less. So, the answer is maximum of all dp of n, j, where j less equals w. There's something interesting about this dp that we haven't seen quite yet. In previous dps, we visited every state. In this dp, there might be some states that are simply unreachable. For example, dp of n4. It is simply not possible to take items so that the total weight is 4 in this example. Does this mean that we've done something wrong? No, dp doesn't have to visit every state. Some of them might remain unreached, that's ok. You just have to make sure that you handle them properly. In this case, we need to make sure we don't consider them as possible answers. Since we fill our array with zeros at the start, we will never choose unvisited dp over a visited one. But in more complicated problems, you might need to be more careful. The video is getting to an end, so you might think, that's it, we know dp. But we have barely dipped our toes into it. There are so many more techniques and optimizations, we can't put them all into one video, even if we wanted to. So, consider this video as part 1 of the series, a humble introduction. Stay tuned for part 2, where we'll get to explore more interesting dp variants. Now the announcement. We have decided to start private programming lessons. We will of course continue to upload free quality videos on this channel, but if you want to try competitive programming and algorithms more seriously, you might benefit from personal lessons a lot. First lesson is free, link in description. By the way, sorry for the upload delay. We took some time to develop the software that we used to create animations for this video. It is still quite janky, so we'll try to improve quality in the future. Thank you for watching, consider subscribing, becoming a supporter, and till the next time, cheers!